Welcome, Axel. Well, first of all, can I ask you, you are the Vice President of Oncology R&D with GlaxoSmithKline. What has attracted you to this small Australian biotech, Imugene? Uh, Imugene's uh, existence actually predates my time at GSK, and it has been uh, a small venture that I founded together with Paul Hopper uh, to bring a new technology, an early technology, that probably would be the next generation of immuno-oncology um, technology. Uh, into a context where it can be developed. Immuno-oncology is a big emerging space. It's the next frontier, if you like, in oncology. What is the opportunity for Imogene? The opportunity for Imogene is to be at the cutting edge of a new area of science that may actually pr provide additional patient, patient benefit. So what we have focused on in immuno-oncology so far, and still is the largest part of this field, is T-cell immunity. So using human T-cells, reprogram them or manipulate them in different ways to achieve impact on cancer cells. Uh, there are other parts of the immune system, for example, B-cells or, for example, the innate immune system that are less well investigated and there are still opportunities for new technologies to emerge and to add to what has already been done with T-cells. Is immunotherapy preferable to chemotherapy or can, can both therapies be used in combination? So it turns out that chemotherapy is still the mainstay of cancer treatment. It is, it's been the beginning of this area. We have, uh, most treatment regimens that are being established are chemotherapy based. There's been another wave of different types of treatments like targeted therapies that came after chemotherapy. They're also integrated into the standards of care. And now the next wave beyond this is immunotherapy. So I expect that with time, immunotherapy will be part of most treatment regimens for cancer. And in some places may replace some of the other modalities. That means chemotherapy may be less frequently used and targeted therapies may be less frequently used depending on the effects that we can achieve. For patients, what is the beauty of immunotherapy? The beauty is twofold. First, larger effects and more durable effects. And the second is, if used properly, a better side effect profile. So, emerging immunotherapies like Imugenes, you would imagine they would eventually, uh, uh, potentially be used in combination with existing chemotherapeutics? In all likelihood, given the current treatment landscape in oncology where there are so many established either chemo or targeted therapies, the probability that a new immunotherapy that uh, gets approved is being used alone is still relatively small. There will be places where it is used alone in late stage patients, but there will be also a lot of places where it's going to be used in combination with existing standards of care. And then there will be another possibility where you have two new treatments combined to achieve a larger effect than existing therapies and replace those existing therapies. What have been the big shining examples in this space? The first one that I would name is uh, the ipilimumab uh, anti-acetyl F4 monoclonal antibody that was approved by the FDA in 2011 and is the first uh, checkpoint modulatory target that has led to a major impact on cancer. The first disease in which this was investigated and approved was metastatic melanoma, and it is still in clinical trials in a variety of other diseases. And it's somewhat a paradigm shift for um, this new area of science and a new checkpoint modulators going beyond uh, CTLA-4 that are either in large clinical trials or one of them actually has just been approved which is a PD-1 blocking antibody, very similar mechanism to CTLA-4, uh, named pembrolizumab. What is the, the potential of immunotherapies uh, in, in terms of long-term remission? So we see with immunotherapies an effect that is very unusual compared to other treatments, which is the so-called plateau or tail end of the survival curve. That suggests that there are patients that live longer and have a more durable effect to therapy than with other treatments. So the unusual component here for immunotherapy is the durability of the benefit. How long can we expect patients to survive? It's not generalizable. It depends on every clinical setting or disease. And then the 
the immunotherapy that's being used. So you can expect that many immunotherapies will likely have long-term effects and help patients to survive longer. But each intervention is different, each patient population is different, so you have to base it on clinical data. And you will see a spectrum of different results. And what was the experience with ipilimumab? So for ipilimumab, we have patients that survive two years or more at about 25%. Compared to? Compared to standard treatments, which would be chemotherapy, for example, where that number is well below 10%. A lot of uh, big pharma is very interested in this space at the moment. How does Imugene, a little Australian company, fit into this scenario, do you think? Imugene is uh, bringing a cutting edge technology forward, which is truly the next generation of immunotherapies. So it fits into the picture because there's a constant need for innovation in the pharmaceutical uh, or drug development uh, space. And Imugene does what other small companies do. They bring cutting edge technology to the space develop it to a certain point where it can show promise, and then hopefully we'll find a partner that will do the rest of the development with the company. So uh, some of the increase in cost can be covered and shared. What are the key value drivers? For Imogen? Yes. Uh, the innovation that comes with the new technology, the fact that it is an immunotherapy and therefore has the potential for long-term benefit and possibly larger clinical effects, and then eventually the safety profile, which we still have to fully establish. There is only phase one data yet on this, on this uh, compound. But I expect that the safety profile, given that this is a vaccine, using a B-cell mechanism that means uh, inducing the production of antibodies, that that will, at the end, have a better safety profile than some standard th therapies. I noticed on one of your slides uh, it, it took something like five months for the immune system to kick, kick in and, and start working, for the immunotherapy to start working. Uh, how long does it take to activate the immune system typically uh, in immunotherapy, using immunotherapy? It's not uniform. So in some cases it may happen actually very quickly. It depends on the state of the immune system at the time of intervention. So for some patients they're very receptive for that kind of intervention. They're responding quickly. Now, there are others where it may take longer. But in principle, if you need to activate cells and have cells divide, so you have certain numbers that can have the effect, it takes weeks, potentially months. For T-cell therapies in particular, it can take that long. So For B-cell therapies, it might be a little bit faster. What does this mean in terms of trial designs um, and e examining how patients are responding? How, how does it, uh, what, do, what could this mean for Imogene? It means that you have to carefully look for the biological effects that you know this therapy can introdu introduce. So we're not only looking at shrinking tumors immediately after treatment. We're also looking at uh, following patients for a longer period of time, accepting a tumor to grow before it shrinks, or just accepting stabilization of disease in the absence of a true response. It can still translate into long-term survival benefit. We have seen that with a variety of different interventions in the immunotherapy area. So those lessons are important and they will be considered in the clinical trials that we will do with the Imogen vaccine. Where can median survival times move to? So median survival times are actually not the best way of looking at this anymore. We would look at rates of survival at certain points in time. So let's say one year survival rate, two year survival rate, number of patients alive at those points in time. And that can move quite far out. For ipilimumab, we have learned that it can be as far as five or even more years for a certain percentage of patients to be alive. And I expect that other immunotherapies can have similar effects. How exciting a development is immunotherapy in the world of oncology? It's a breakthrough. It's a complete paradigm shift. Oncology has always been viewed as an area where you have a lot of innovation, but incremental benefit. That means existing treatments have provided a certain level of um, benefit, and we added small incremental improvements over that. Now with immunotherapy, we're beginning to see larger, more transformational effects, and hopefully that will lead to a good number of patients benefiting, much more than what we have ever seen before. I noticed the analysts were asking about uh, uh, trial results in immunotherapy. It might take something like 56 months and they said that's just not feasible. What other endpoints can you be looking at along the way? 
So it depends on the study, depends on the disease. So in some instances, a 56-month study is quite an acceptable trial. For a phase 3 study, it can be. However, of course, if it, the intervention can lead to uh, faster readouts, uh, one, of course, would want to take those. So one can look at response differently, measure a broader spectrum of responses if the immunotherapy introduces those, and therefore uses new re response criteria uh, that can measure those effects. So that's one thing. And the other would be looking at the survival endpoint differently. So instead of just a hazard ratio and a certain number of events over time, one can look at landmark or milestone survival, which is something like a one-year time point, a two-year time point, and so on, that enables you to get the data faster. Now, Imugene's uh, technology, uh, Hervax, my understanding, is, is uh, primarily looking at breast and gastric cancers. Now, are there any uh, examples of immunotherapy, any shining examples of immunotherapy in those cancers, or is this sort of, uh, uh, are they pioneering uh, immunotherapy in this space? Yeah, so the usual suspect diseases for immunotherapy intervention have been melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, and a few others. Uh, gastric cancer or breast cancer are not among those. So the immunotherapy area is just moving towards addressing these diseases. And you see some effects. So for the PD-1 antibodies, there's been some data suggesting gastric cancer can respond to immunotherapy, but there are not so many interventions yet that have gone there. So I think you will see more of that, and Imugen is certainly at the forefront of this. From a, from a clinical perspective, is that an enormous opportunity? It is an opportunity for patients, because patients, especially with these diseases, are always looking for new options, particularly options that may not be as safe, uh, unsafe as previous therapies. So I would expect the more you can offer to patients as, inter as investigation, uh, the highest the probability of success. So gastric cancer has been underserved with clinical trials and I hope that this will contribute to better chances for patients to achieve benefit. From your, or your expert perspective, what do you think uh, of the Imogen opportunity? I believe Imogen uh, contributes something important to the immunotherapy field uh, because it addresses a mechanism of action that hasn't really been used yet. So pro reprogramming, reprogramming B cells to make antibodies against cancer targets uh, is a new mechanism, not unexpected, but something that hasn't been well investigated and probably will add to the big picture of immuno-oncology. So especially since the field is moving towards combination therapy, if this is an effective agent and it might be combined with another effective agent, you may see transformational effects. So we need these tools to produce the best cancer therapies we can get. Axel, can you sum up the breadth of the opportunity presented by immuno-oncology? Yeah, so immuno-oncology is, contrary to many other areas of science in, in cancer, uh, extremely broad. So the immune system is a complex organ that has multiple components. Each one of them lends itself for a drug intervention. So they, I can highlight three major areas. One would be uh, T-cell immunity which is the area that's the most heavily investigated at the present time, uh, where different modalities of intervention, from monoclonal antibodies to cytokines to biospecific antibodies, um, vaccines, uh, adjuvants, a variety of different interventions, all go towards modulating the T-cell response. Now, other areas could be the B-cell response, so you're actually using the antibody factories of the immune system to make specific antibodies against cancer cells, or using the innate immune system, the less specific but faster part of the immune response to contribute to the overall impact on disease. So I think the, the breadth of this opportunity is so much wider than what you have in some other areas, like chemotherapy, that uh, needs to be fully leveraged. How can immunotherapy, how can we describe it? Does it just fire up the immune system or does it work on all different parts of the immune system? Can you put that into your more scientific words. The word firing up the immune system is actually nice. Uh, immunotherapy should do that. It should fire up the immune system in a very focused way towards cancer cells. Unfortunately, not all the interventions that we currently have are that specific. Some of them actually fire up the immune system against the cancer 
and against some normal tissues and you get side effects that are not desired, but they're usually manageable. So we know how to handle this and then the patient would undergo not only the immunotherapy intervention, but also then some side effect management if that is necessary. So I believe with time we will learn more how to do this as effectively as possible with the least amount of side effects. But as I said at the beginning, the immune, immune system is a complex system. It has very, many different parallel mechanisms. And if you play with one, you might actually also influence the other. And we're still learning. So there is more uh, of opportunity here to fine tune the immune response. You had another slide there about biomarkers and about identifying biomarkers to measure the immune response. Can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit for me? Yeah, so biomarkers are usually very desirable tools to help drug development because they enable you, for example, to identify patients that might respond better or respond at all to any given intervention or they help you to predict side effects or in this new situation where we like to combine agents, they might help you to understand how two agents can play together. So biomarkers are important tools but they're also complicated to develop. And uh, in most cases, you need to first understand the science. So what is actually the molecule that you're looking for? What does it mean when it changes in, uh, in its uh, presence or absence, level of expression, or impact on other components of the biologic system in which you look at it? And the second is the method under which you investigate it. Sometimes the method needs, is not well established and then the results are not reliable. So establishing the method to measure the biomarker is as important as the biomarker itself. So as the field evolves, we're making progress on both fronts, the science and the methods. And I think that will together help us to identify the right markers, to use our therapies to the full extent. Final message for, for investors for me. The final message is uh, look at the data, look at the uh, promise of the technology, and enable new immunotherapy companies to make a contribution to the field. So that means I would invest in Imogen and uh, enable them to conduct their clinical studies so they can deliver the results that we need to judge what the therapy can do. Thank you very much, Axel. Thank you.